leadership. And this is gonna be a very, very unique video on leadership. Different than someone like say, John Maxwell, who I admire, and he talks about leadership. Rather, this is gonna be talking about leadership, not in a traditional way, but within the context of something called hypergamy or hypergamy or however you wanna pronounce it. Now, what is hypergamy and what does that have to do with leadership? Well, in case you've never heard this before, but we'll keep this quick because you probably have, hypergamy is the idea that people are attracted to those who have a higher value than them. And oftentimes in the podcast space, they try to attribute that to you being six feet plus, six figure, six pack, six inches, something about that 666. But in my view, they kind of just do that to relate to women because most women do not really understand the underlying actual mechanics of attraction, which is largely based on frame and emotions and validation and sexual market value, much like how you might have a Rolex watch, which is really just a metal piece of shit. But because the market value is like 100 grand for say a Rolex watch or a Patek Philippe or Audemars Piguet, the market value is high. It's actually a worse watch than a Timex. The problem with a lot of the podcasts is they tell you to become a Timex. It's not about the perception. It's just about objectively how much value you have. And really what I try to focus on is the perception, the emotions, validation, state pumping, um, and frames, right? Frame control is everything. Now, I've done a lot of other videos on the topic of frame control. I hope that by now you get it. But I can promise you that coming up, I will do some incredibly powerful content on frame control, okay? But what I want you to understand within the context of this video is that you have hypergamy, which is an asymmetry in sexual market value that generates both attraction with people that you're looking to attract, but also in business makes people give you a halo effect and makes them focus on your positive traits. If you had 100 positive traits, half of which are good, half of which are bad, when you have hypergamy, they focus on the positive and ignore the negative. And if you have low value, they focus on the negative not the positive, okay? Now, the phenomenon that I talked about was in relationships, cheating, cheating is massive. And generally the way this lays out, we talked about this in the past two videos, is that let's say you had 97 good traits or 97 good things that you did in a relationship and three that are bad. When you have the value, they focus on the 97% and they love you to death and they're sweet and they're nice and loyal and ride or die. But when you lose value, they tend to focus on just the three things, that becomes your identity. You missed me at the donut shop that one time, you didn't get me this gift that I wanted and you said a mean thing and you're the guy who didn't get the donut and said the mean thing. That's you, Be mean thing, no donut guy, I hate you. And they believe it in their heart of hearts and that happens because if they see that you've lost value, it is an evolutionary mechanism to eject you so they do not have your child or if you're working together to eject you so that they don't hitch their wagon to you in their business and fuck up their career. The RAS flip happens so that they don't wind up in a bad position. They do it because they're also deeply in your frame because they're being led by you and have to extricate themselves. And so you may not feel like you have to RAS flip on them because you weren't in their frame, you were leading it. So you don't need to like convince your brain, but they need to do to kind of convince their brain to do something really for themselves that makes sense for them. It's hard to deal with, it's a knife in the back, but it's also life. And you have to accept that people also have to look out for themselves too. That is part of life, okay? Now, what I've explained in the past two videos that people can be ride or die, but you do have to consider where they're coming from and stop looking to find this perfect ride or die person. Rather, much like how you'd wear a condom, and if you wore a condom, you'd never find out, I mean, to be fair, a condom can break or a condom can fail, but let's just say if it was perfect in a hypothetical world, not giving you medical advice, condoms can fail. But it feels a little too good, you know, partway through, you're like, why does this feel so good? Fail, <laughs> okay? Baby coming, AIDS, whatever, right? When it, when it feels good, that means the baby at AIDS is possibly coming. Now, from that standpoint, you wear a condom because if you use it perfectly, you could have hooked up with someone with an STD and you'd never know. You'd never know that there's this chlamydia disease-ridden pus hole. You would have never known that, because <laughs> I hope, because you wore the condom. Well, in the same way, Rather, rat, you know, in the same way, like you don't go to every single person and be like, let me see it here. Is there any chlamydia up there? I mean, maybe you do. Good for you. <laughs> Probably if you do, but probably you just wear a fucking condom, right? Well, in the same way, if you do leadership properly, you're not going to find out that that person was disloyal in most cases because, because you're on point, you're leading and you're going to bring the best out of them. So in many ways, you could argue that a universal shit test that you could fail is that you're not awesome. Anytime that you believe you're not awesome, you failed the shit test. You fucking failed. You're awesome. Why? Just because. And if you don't believe that, you fail the shit test. Well, in the same way, 
if you don't, if you believe that anyone is like different, like the good girl, the bad girl, or the better employee, the worst employee, yes, there's gradients of it. Cluster B, personality disorder, trauma, relationship with the parents. Yes, there is personality traits that are different. But in reality, when you have the value and you lead, you get a different version of each person. If I run a seminar up here, everybody's incredibly nice. I do a party up here, everybody's incredibly nice. But if I fail to lead, a lot of those same people would be mean. You get a different version. The fact that you even believe anyone is different, you failed a sort of a universal shit test. So what we're gonna be going into this in this video is leadership and how to bring the best out of people by not just saying, well, I've got, I have a connection with them so I could not lead, but the connection will carry the day or they have to be loyal to me when in reality, I'm not even adding value to their life, right? And instead what it means to lead and so that you create a win-win for others and actually have empathy for where they're coming from as well. And in doing so, you're gonna be surrounded by people that are ride or die, okay? And I've learned this through a lot of harsh lessons, I've talked about them, and the harsh lessons I'll be revealing to you today will be very, very powerful and change your life, but let me tell you something. Would you like to be part of a community that focuses on this level of leadership? Would you like to be a part of a community where you get personalized feedback from coaches every single day, often twice a day? Would you like to take part in an 80 hour program that I spent five years creating and charge about five grand for? And then actually that mentoring group I charge about 3,700 for as the entry point. Well, actually, if you look right in here, Blueprint Reloaded, that right there, www.blueprintreloaded.com, is the best program that I put out since 2016, okay? It's been about eight years since I put out a major program release. I've worked on this for close to a decade. You're gonna absolutely go crazy when you see this. How would you describe what it was like when you attended that in real life when you first came? Yeah, it was extremely clarifying, honing in on exactly what your niche is, exactly how you're using your time and your day um, to be able to learn marketing at a high level, to be able to communicate at a high level. It's, it's one thing to... It's, it's one thing to, to learn it. It's another thing to do it under pressure. And there's so many ac uh, action-oriented exercises. And you get to s see how this is exactly done step-by-step. Step, uh, rather than it just being vague theory, it is done step-by-step. Step, and that that is extremely, extremely clarifying. Yeah, very, very organized program. And also, of course, if you like those OG social skills, right in there as well. Best program in personal growth in existence, in my view. I don't think that you could find another program as good in personal growth or in OG social skills. I really don't think that you could. Let me tell you something. If you don't get at least double the understanding of these topics in your life, and if you don't believe that you're moving to double the results at a very, very rapid pace, refund the fucking thing. My personal belief is you should get 10x the results. I almost called it the 10x blueprint reloaded just because I believe that you should get 10x the results, okay? I would not have called it the sequel to the blueprint decoded, the best program from back in my 20s, unless I knew that this was by far the next level. This is the most advanced program ever done in self-help. OG social skills, communication, public speaking. The fact that my 11 year old can public speak, you maybe wanna learn how to do that. I know this stuff works and I know with the right blueprint that you can change your fucking life, okay? I know it. So get inside Blueprint Reloaded. We'll see you on the inside. Now, what we're gonna be doing is pointing the fact that you're at a fork in the road. You are at a fork in the road in your life right now. And what it means is that you can look at hypergamy and you can be pissed off about it, or you can say to yourself, wait a minute, so are you saying that with hypergamy, I can be a three out of 10 in sexual market value, raise my value to a 10, and I can date other 10s, or I could be a three out of 10 as somebody who basically knows how to make money, but that if I were to lead an organization, I could make hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, everybody else gets paid 30 grand, 80 grand, 120 grand, but I get paid hundreds of millions of dollars because I understand how to lead. Do you really, if, if right now you could snap your fingers and get rid of hypergamy, would you do it? Well, whatever you'd rate yourself right now is who you'd wind up in a relationship with. If you're a five, you're gonna have a five. If you're a six, you're gonna have a six. I mean, maybe, maybe even if you, um, you know, were seven, you'd have a seven. Why would you want to get rid of that? Um, likewise, if you're maybe somebody who makes like 30 grand a year right now, well, you could never build a business. You just always have a job. You couldn't go hire other people because you're building a containing environment that other people wanna be a part of and they wanna come make money for you. So why would you want to get rid of the fact that people pedestalize those who lead? I don't think that's actually the right decision. Now, when you have a significant other dump you or a coworker or a partner fuck you over and steal from you and stab you in the back, or cheat on you in relationships, it's one of the most painful things you can ever been through. And I've been driven to the point that I was the one to blow my fucking brains out. Never would actually do it, by the way. If that ever happens, it wasn't me, okay? But uh, no John McAfee here, anything like that. But um, 
I felt that way. I've been driven, you know, to the point of just wishing I would just didn't even fucking live at certain points. I never would do it, but I'm just so sad at what I saw. It's so dark of a place that it can drive you to. So I want to be clear here. I understand that it can drive you to a dark place. I get that. Okay. But in that darkness, what eventually you do is you unhook off mommy's milk. Because what you've been doing is you're going, mommy, 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 <laughs> mommy, I need that unconditional love. I need it, I need it, I need it, right? <laughs> Ironically, it's when you don't need it that you get the unconditional love. See, if you learn how to lead properly, a lot of your staff are gonna be so ride or die. You know, it, 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 create, it creates almost like, a, like a, a, an environment where people are obsessed with what it is that you're doing, right? Like, you look at some of these incredible organizations where everybody that works there is obsessed with company culture, accepts obsessed with company mission, right? Or maybe you're dating someone and they literally would go to the end of the earth for you. The joke they used to say about Justin Bieber, they called it the cut for Bieber crew, right? They cut for Bieber, okay? As a joke, I would hope. So, you know, clearly that ride or die component is something that can be generated. Having a company culture where people are not, for the most part, fucking you over and are hyper loyal and dedicated to the vision is something that can be generated. So you're at a fork in the road where you can sit there watching podcasts that are saying, hypergamy sucks, shaving the girls, people are fuckers, people are shit, and so on and so forth. And there's only so many hours in a given day. And I'm not saying not to watch those because I think it's good that they inform you of it. And I also think that, that it's not all black and white. They also show you a lot of solutions there too. So a lot of good stuff in those. But what I'd say is, how many hours do you have in a day? And if in two years from now or three years from now or 10 years from now, you use your time one way versus another way, where are you gonna be? Crushing it in dating, crushing it in money, crushing it in friends, having fun, building businesses, being a millionaire? Or are you gonna be somebody who's just sitting there pissed off at the world and just typing in how everybody sucks into your phone, okay? And shaving them and wanting them to enable you. You see, what, you see where I'm going with this? So that's what we're here to talk about is leadership. And we're gonna kind of oscillate between romantic relationships, but also company culture. And if you were to watch this for say, like we're, we're basically at a minute 11, we're going to minute 12. Let's say that right now, okay, I'm going to picture this, okay? Right now, I want you to imagine that we're right around minute 60, where we'll probably roughly wrap this up, we'll decide, okay, roughly. And imagine if by minute 60 of this video, you have a completely clear vision of where you wanna put your time and focus and energy and momentum, and that you actually carry forward. What we're gonna do right here in this video for the next several years, imagine that you also jump into blueprintreloaded.com, www.blueprintreloaded.com, website right there. You hop in there and get some accountability. You get, a, you get a group of people that are in the same wavelength. You get personal coaching and feedback. You get the best program at all self help. You get in there and imagine if in a couple of years from now, you've absolutely fucking changed your life. Like imagine what that could look like. Imagine it. That can happen, but it starts first of all with you clicking and getting inside the blueprint and also between now and minute 60, we are going to fucking crush it for you. Now, this is the first time that we've taught this exact content within this framework, okay? But it's within the framework that basically you have hypergamy, which is an aria slip that both men and women do, although it's strictly defined for women to men, I guess, but the same phenomenon of like selfish DNA, mm -hmm. rationalization, mm -hmm. RES flips, all that stuff. That is something that happens to both men and women and showing you how to make it where that hypergamy, that RES flip shifts in the positive so you get the halo effect. Now, what we talked about in the last video with Sid and I was we kind of jokingly called it like hypergamy acceptance. That's kind of like what the video was, right? It was like having empathy with where somebody else was coming from and why they would have an RES flip. And the basic thing that we said is that if they're in your frame and you're leading, then to pull themselves out of it, yes, there, there's a mechanism that, that's there that's almost a little bit cruel that blasts them out of it, right? We get that. And they do that in order to spare um, you know, like so that their DNA can go on. So they don't waste their time attached to a bad organization or a bad relationship that's not going on with a loser guy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we can all become loser guys and I've become that and we've all become that and we all learn the hard way, but we learn and we grow. So from that same standpoint, why don't we reverse that? Why don't we shift the conversation to how we reverse that perception, okay? So the first thing that I want you to recognize is the importance of what you call pedestalization. And that basically means basic level social value. So the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to go down to Rodeo Drive if you live in LA or down to Ball Harbor Mall if you live in Miami or go to, is it Michigan Avenue in, in Chicago? I'm not sure. Really nice one, right? Like we're all, is it Superior, Michigan, whatever, you know, where everybody likes to, when they, when they riot, they like to rob it. It's like, otherwise really nice. Okay, so, you know, Summer of Love and all that. So basically what you, Summer of Love. So basically what you have is like, um, Go look at the fanciest jackets, the fanciest watches, diamond jewelry, super luxury stuff. And what I want you to realize is that a lot of this stuff is not even worth that much money, 
but look at the exclusivity that they put around it and how they're able to pedestalize themselves, okay? So for example, if you go to Goyard um, and you go in there and you wanna get a little billfold, and let's say that there's 10 of them within a um, little glass box, right? And you say, hey, could I just check all 10 colors? They're only gonna get out three. Why are they not gonna take out all 10 for you to look at it? Because it makes it look like something from fucking Kmart. Tr try to understand that a simple billfold from Goyard, which is just a little piece of leather that sells for about $500 with tax, it's it, that same little billfold, you could buy it fucking Kmart for $3.99. It's all in the framing. It's on Rodeo. It has the lighting. It has a snobby French helper. You had to wait in line to get in and invest. It's the framing that's around it. Now, we've made many, 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 many other videos, but I don't, so I don't want to make this like a five hour video about framing and exclusivity and, and, you know, value for time, value for attention and so on and so forth. Um, I'd recommend that you look up other videos where we talk about that. And if you want, you could cover a short version of this, but basically just what does it mean to be exclusive? Sid and I actually went to this, um, museum called the Guggenheim in New York. And, and how do you kind of describe the Guggenheim? <laughs> It, it, it looks like the, the fanciest museum, but then when you actually look at the individual paintings and art, artwork, it's like a five-year-old doodled it. It's like a, I'm not even kidding, a drawing of a nipple, a drawing of, you know, like a cucumber, like a little black and white, white television screen with a guy in a bathtub, and there's no other context given. So it's, it, it's, it's. Now, what's funny is you would never look at this in a million years, but why, why does it have value? Because we, first of all, we had to get in the Uber to go to the Guggenheim. So it's for, we're going to a physical location. So we're investing time, energy, money, and then it's the lighting on that they're putting onto the artwork. It's the framing that they're doing. It's the fact that we, you know, had to spend money to get into the Guggenheim. It's the fact that everybody else is walking around the Guggenheim and looking at these individual doodles, and that kind of provides the doodles social proof. So then it puts the doodles on a uh, on a pedestal, and it makes us stare at it even further. So like something as simple as a doodle will stare at for five minutes, trying to extract trying to decipher meaning out of it, even though we know, we know the game behind the game, but you'll see other individuals stare at a doodle for like you know, 10, 20 minutes, trying to extract some kind of meaning out of it, and they're looking at the intricacies of it, and they're deciphering the, the cultural significance of what the doodle means, and so on and so forth, when in reality, if a five-year-old created a doodle, you wouldn't even look at it for a second. Yeah, so, it's, so go to the Guggenheim, go to art galleries, go to luxury stores, find things that, and here's the, the magic key, that have no inherent worth, but that somehow are pedestalized, right? And even realize, like a lot of time, for example, if you're talking to a woman and her hair is done up and she has makeup and she's shaved and she has a dress and da 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 right? And notice that the frame is always, you're talking to her, but if at any point you say something that she doesn't like, she just walks off. So what's the underlying frame? You're qualifying yourself to her. And if you do one little thing that she doesn't like, she gets what's called the ick and she just walks off, right? But the way that you beat her to the punch is you, you beat her to the punch to the ick where now you're qualifying her and what happens is that now it reverses the frame and you become the Guggenheim. And then maybe you might walk off. It's like, oh no, wait, come back. And so on and so forth, right? So this is understanding the buyer-seller dynamic and the perception of value. So before we even get into something like, well, you have to make X amount of dollars, realize no matter how much money you actually make, if the buyer-seller dynamic is not in place, they're not gonna appreciate it. Like, someone could be dating Drake, and if he becomes a little bit too commonplace, like, why does this motherfucker always just sit there with his stupid-ass friends in the fucking studio? Mm -hmm. Fucking Drake is annoying. You know, they're dating Leo DiCaprio. Fucking Leo, like, you know, he, he has, like, a dad bod, and he just sits there, like, getting all crazy in these acting roles. He's gone months at a time, and he just sits there eating fucking hamburgers. I fucking hate this guy, mm -hmm. right? You know, Dr. Dre got left by his wife. Tom fucking Brady the goat. I mean, look, if Tom Brady can get to be by a 40-year-old woman, then realize it can absolutely happen to you. I don't care if you're Tom Brady, uh, you know, if you're um, Dr. Dre. I mean, this happens to everybody, okay? It's happened to me. Uh, Depedestalization, with, with, even with the woman who is the love of your life, can happen. And it's a funny thing because I remember I was talking to my buddy Mike, and his wife had just left him. And, I, and she would barely even look at him for months. She had disgust for him. And I said, bro, when you go out there and you say goodbye to her, say, you know what, baby, I love you. 
And if, you know, if this is what you want, I trust your female instinct um, that this is for the best. And I trust you that this is the right choice and, and I'm excited for you. And I've used my friend. And in effect, translation, I don't give a fuck. I'm probably gonna go date hotter people. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Like that's, like it sounds sweet on the surface, but it's like, well, how could you be not that upset? Maybe a better option. And, and I remember he called me after, and he, he said, he started screaming. He was like, oh my God, oh my God, what the fuck? He started going, this fucking voodoo. And he, he was losing his mind, like this fucking voodoo. I mean, you know Mike, right? He's like, fucking voodoo, fucking voodoo, fucking voodoo, this fucking voodoo, this fucking voodoo, this fucking voodoo. I go, what, what, what would happen? He's like, she hasn't looked at me like that in months. I said to her, I said it. She looked up at me with that same love from years ago, from our wedding night, that same passion, that same love, it finally came back. It came back and she looked at me right in the eyes. We were about to kiss. We were about to kiss. And I said, and what happened? And he said, she looked at me and she said, is it true? Do you really mean it? She's about to kiss me and get back together with me. She hadn't even looked, she looked at me with disgust for months. And I said, what did you say? What did you say? Well, he goes, well, bro, I mean, you know, I love her. She's loved my life. I got to be honest. So I just said, hey, that's what Owen told me to say. And then she started, and, and then she screamed and she ran off and she drove off. And I'm like, well, that's not a very happy ending. And he's like, no, but bro, I mean, look, she'd already fucking cheated on me at that point. It's probably for the best she didn't come back. But what I like was the fact that it showed me that if I can go back into abundance and I had the buyer-seller dynamic, that that, what I thought was this kind of authentic love is actually generated through my behavior via the buyer-seller dynamic. So do you, do you see how what's going on here is that when you understand how to pedestalize yourself, you suddenly get the reaction of, you know, you being the love of somebody's life or you being the incredible organization to work for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't tell you how many times I've been, you know, had some of my, what in my life who, you know, barely even talk to them, no exclusivity on my side. And I'm always being told you're the love of my life. I'm so connected to you. Like all the things that you wish you would hear, you just do your own thing so that your time is valued and you're not even willing to be exclusive because you have that optionality. And you're, you will often hear from the people who, you know, they're normally so hard to get because they're so in demand, suddenly say that you're the love of their life. You're the perfect soul connection. You are the twin flame, et cetera, et cetera. And you're like, but all that I do is just party. Like, why do you even think that? Like I'm retarded. Um, and then meanwhile, the one who, you, and it isn't always funny that the one who you want that from, then they kind of just say, oh, I don't want to be exclusive and da, 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 da. Do you understand that? So that has to do with the buyer seller dynamic. You would rather have a Audemars Piget or a Patek Philippe or a Rolex watch in most cases. Maybe you wouldn't because you're unique, you're so cool. But for most people, they'd rather have that the than, Apple. yeah, than the, yeah, the Mac watch that has yeah. all these other features or the Whoop or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not even just talking because you could resell it, but even if you couldn't resell it because of the cachet involved. So that is the first thing is you've got to start asking yourself, how are you being depedestalized and losing your cachet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and you'll and you'll buy that Rolex watch, and you'll and then all of a sudden you become a connoisseur of the gears and this and that. When before you never even gave a a, a shit about the gears or the movement or it's the the. the horology, by the way. The, what is it called? Hot horology. Hot horology. Hot horology. Hot horology. Yeah, exactly. High horology. But yeah, it, all of a sudden you're a connoisseur of the diamonds and the materials and the scarcity of those materials, and you know every little, last little detail of it. But here's the thing your iPhone or your iWatch does more functionally. So what does that mean? So even if the buyer seller dynamic, if it's skewed in your favor, even if you are worse in your in your skills, your the value that you actually brought to the table, the perceived value because of that buyer seller dynamic will still make you look like the better option. So you have to think about things through the lens of perceived value. How are you tilting that buyer seller dynamic? And Scarcity and the ability to make an individual invest to get that scarcity is how you do that. Scarcity meaning you create, there's, you, as, as you said, you put a, you, first of all, think about your time and attention as actually having tangible value. That's the key to everything. My time and attention has value. And then from there, how can I get an individual to, to go down a path of investing to get my time and attention? And then how do I create competition anxiety around getting my time and attention. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, words like anxiety, I think can be taken the wrong way. It's not even about anxiety. It's just about clearly showing that the value is there in a way that is indisputable is the best way that I could put it. Because I want people to feel loved and cared for, but it should also be obvious that there's value there. 
So that would be another way to put it is like, it's not about provoking anxiety. Cause I think a lot of people struggle with that word. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like, you're using that word colloquially. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right? Yeah, like yeah. in like a funny locker room. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay? you never want someone to have anxiety, exactly. but what you want them to have would be um, awareness that the value is there. Right? Like you're not gonna have anxiety that other people want the Rolex watch, but you're damn well aware that other people want it, right? So colloquially, a word that you could use would be competition anxiety, okay? Now, from that same standpoint, as we continue down the rabbit hole here, what you're saying to yourself is, well, why do I have to generate that? Why do I have to generate exclusivity? It's so much work. No, wrong. David Data has the answer there, which is what he says is be on your purpose. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to sit there like, a, like, like Rasputin generating <laughs> um, you know, this kind of value for yourself in some kind of mechanical wrote way, which is blocking a genuine communication. Rather what it is, is that when you have a beautiful, beautiful purpose in your life in some capacity, then there's something that's more important to you than just pandering and chasing another person. So that could be your connection to God. That could be your connection to your passions. That could be things that you like to do. Maybe that's just you laughing like a fucking retard with your friends, whatever the case may be. But whatever that actually is, um, you care about it because you value your own attention and time, okay? You have love, that's called self-love. Mm -hmm. It's called enjoying your own experience yeah. through your own eyes of life. Yeah, and the, and the thing about that is it can't be faked. It oozes out of your pores. People can feel that off of you. So even, even if you create, there, there's, there's value cre creation in terms of like, you, you know, you throw a party or you generate so much value to where, uh, in, in your business to where people want to work for you, you're getting inbound leads as far as people, you know, wanting to become your employee or, or, or you're not reach, doing outreach anymore. You're getting inbound leads. That's one way to generate the value. But the other way is what he's saying here, when you ground yourself to that higher purpose or you're having just more fun than people around you, that's in your, in, that's in your, the more micro side in terms of your communication with individuals around you and they can feel that. So you want to think about how can you set up your business or your environment so that people are starting to having, they're having to invest into you to get your time and attention. And then how can you actually think about your, your communication to where, or based on how you're grounded to a higher purpose or how you're just having fun to where that now oozes out onto other people where they feel that this person does not need me. This person has something better going on than to, you know, they're, they're, they have better stuff going on than just to interact with me. They might enjoy interacting with me, but their purpose is primarily different than me. They're not needing anything from me. Yeah, and the next thing that I would say from that is that you have a boundary. So in other words, you are now centered. You're not pandering to some other person, right? So you are centered via the experience of your own life through your own eyes. So you're the hero in your own movie, right? They call that a main character energy on TikTok, okay? Little crazy place, little pocket of craziness. Main character energy, hero of your own movie, you know, king of your own castle, queen of your own kingdom, whatever the case, okay? And so you're immersed in being present to the moment, gratitude to God, laughing, having fun on your mission, and then somebody else comes into that, and they're a guest inside your reality. Now, when you hear that, there's two different ways that you could hear that, right? One way that you could hear that is like a win-lose, like, like kind of like you're this arrogant prick fucker who's like, you're a gust in my reality, like very arrogant, which to me, that type of heavy-handed frame control is actually very, very insecure. Like whenever you see someone frame controlling too much, it reeks of insecurity. Like the, the, the worst, most toxic kind of person does that kind of very active frame control. Rather, it's a very effortless frame control, which is like, I love myself. And I'm welcoming, welcoming you into something that's actually fucking cool. Like you've actually built something that's fucking cool. You've built a nest that somebody else can come feel comfortable inside, right? So for example, say that you're a man and you met a woman who was looking to have kids and you're looking to have kids and she really worked on like detoxing, going to the sauna, taking supplements, eating really, really healthy, um, you know, preparing her body for childbirth. And she's like, yo, like, like my preparation for childbirth, like, you know, to, and, and I'm like level-headed and, you know, I'm going to be a great mother and I care about being a mother. And you're like, oh my God, like this is speaking to me. This is so cool. She's done that. Right. And she's like, look, I know a great guy's coming because I've put in the work. You're appreciative of that. You're not like, why are you trying to manipulate me to make me scared? <laughs> you know, you appreciate it. Well, in the same way, when you've built that kind of leadership, you've, you've sort of done your role to build sort of a nest. And likewise, if it's in your business, 
You know, when, you, when your business has, like say, say it's our company that we do here, right? And we're helping the world as best we can. We're doing the best that we can. We're innovating, we're strategizing, we're pushing forward with the bleeding edge, it's exciting. Well, maybe you wanna come and be a part of that. And so if, we, if we're the kind of organization where, um, you know, we really, really needed you and like we're fucked without you and we're, and like even though we have something cool going on here, mm -hmm. you suddenly become the prize and like you're like, why is, why are they doing this? Like, this is so fucking weird. Why are, they, why are they just magically just chasing me around the block? Is this place creepy? And so now all of a sudden that, what, what we are saying, no, but we love you. We have, we're in love with you. We're in love with you. You know, and it's, it's, it's kind of like just chasing you around and it's sort of, you can grab it, it's sort of yeah. depedestalizing you and it's creeping you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and the big key is when, when, when you are gonna create demand on yourself, you, you need to do it from a frame where people, it, it, it's it's not something you say to qualify yourself. It's like people have to actually see it. They have to see the value that you're bringing and they have to see other people pining for that value, trying to get that value from you as well. Um, super, super, super important. Um, next thing that's very important and from a business- oh, By the way, let's, yeah. let's nail up boundaries too. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, but w once, you, once you have too many options coming at you, I mean, you, you have to set up boundaries. Now, it, it first it, first and foremost, it obviously starts in your subcommunication. It starts in your voice. And people can hear that from you. They can feel that from you. And once they, once they feel that from you, they hear that from you in your tonality, in the, uh, the, the inflection in your voice, so on and so forth, then people make a, a lot of assumptions about you. What does it say when you have a boundary or uh, you're signifying that you have a boundary in your voice? It's, it's signifying to other people around you that you have too many options and that you need to filter those options. And naturally, when somebody needs to filter options, your brain wants to take, people's brain wants to take that shortcut, that DNA shortcut, or what do they call it? Like in dating, it's like mate choice copying. It wants to take that shortcut. You assume it is the better option. It has more value. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times where um, you know, I might be in a romantic relationship with somebody and it's just beginning and they start to act out and they're testing to see where the boundary is. And I say, look, I can't talk to you anymore. And I literally just go unresponsive and cold. And then maybe I see them out at a venue at some point and the response is off the charts, super positive. And sometimes they'll act out so strong that all that you can do is just put a hard boundary on it. But that is the only way where they see where the boundary is. And that's the only way where they can actually be interested in what it is that you're doing, right? And in the same way, you know, when you're running an organization, there's a natural injection of chaos that people will do when they feel that they're in a non-contained environment. They just become chaotic, okay? So for example, like if I'm running a seminar and, and you, you come on it and you can feel that there's no boundary there, you will just start shit talking it to other students there. Like if it's clear that I would tolerate a bunch of shit talk at an event, mm -hmm. people will randomly feel an impulse to start shit talking. Like any boundary that you're missing if you're leading a seminar, the audience will just start doing, okay? You know, maybe someone jumps up, they put their hand up and they wanna hog the mic and just go on and on and on the mic. And if you don't go, yo, thank you, brother, appreciate it, have a seat. If you don't do that, mm -hmm. then other people start hogging the mic and then people start shit talking. People will get fucking crazy. So if I'm running a seminar and I've got a clear mission and there's exclusivity on it and there's a boundary on it and people can feel that boundary and they're going to test that boundary, they will inject chaos into it and they're doing so because they want to see, should I go into this frame? So the boundary shows people this frame is safe. I was talking a couple days ago about a celebrity client that I just picked up and I didn't do this on purpose. It was not a technique, but he was starting to say a bunch of crazy shit and I had to tell him to shut up. And it was only when I said that, that he's like, you're hired. And this guy has the creme de la creme, de la creme, de la creme, de la creme, times infinity, no limit on his options. But nobody said, yo bro, you gotta shut the fuck up. Let's get to the fucking promised land. But oh wait, this is a contained environment. But it took that, okay? And that was not a tactic. That was not meant to provoke a reaction. That was me having a clear vision of where I want to take him. He's getting too outside that vision. Yo, shut the fuck up. Let's go here. Do you want to go here? Then shut the fuck up. Okay, and that has to be there. So in any seminar that I run, at some point, I got to tell you to shut the fuck up. If we go hit the field and you're like, eh, I don't know, I don't know. I go, yo, shut the fuck up. You know, if we're in a relationship, hey, shut the fuck up.
Notice how naturally that comes out. That is when you generate <laughs> safety because people act out and they will see that they will inject chaos up until the point that you will tolerate it, okay? Likewise, the example I've given, I've done parties here where it was too loose. Guys all start coming in, okay? You're like, oh, men can come in here. So a bunch of fucking dudes come in. Then they start fighting each other. Then they start getting drunk. Then they start trying to steal drinks. Then they start smashing shit. Then they start pissing. Any environment without boundaries is what's called, and repeat this after me, write this in the fucking comments, race to the bottom. Let me make this clear. It is a race to the bottom. No matter how fucked up the behavior and chaos that you think will happen, it's more fucked up. More fucked up. It's like a deranged, demonic world. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like... Let the example I gave the party, just guy just whips his cock out. Just starts pissing on the floor. People are watching. Why? Just because. You know, like people just start... Like I, I've been at parties at Queen's University... People just start riding. You know, you'll, you'll see like a random cute little girl, you know, maybe 22, just pick up a bottle of alcohol and just throw it at a car. She doesn't even know why she did it. She doesn't know why. It's like Nala, Nala Fitness, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, I just want to start cheating. Why? non canadian environment. I just want to start fucking. I just want to start cheating, right? You know, guy acts a beta. I was like, oh my God, like get yeah. this beta come out of me. I got to go. I got to go fuck somebody. It's like you lose boundary. Fucking's happening. Cheating's happening. Outrageous anarchy. accusations, yeah. fucking anarchy uh -huh. because of a lack of leadership. And it's like, well, why are they being so mean? Why are they RES letting me, cheating on me, fucking dudes yelling at me, divorcing me, taking half my shit or more, trying to take all of it. We shared those vows. Now we're in court. They're trying to take it all. Why? Why? Because you had no fucking boundary. The DNA, the, the DNA feeling the boundary fundamentally, what, what does that mean? It means it needs to feel that they could get kicked out of the tribe or there is some type of consequence for not falling into your frame. And everybody enjoys the environment more when they are adhering to the right boundary if they are bought into your frame. The, the guys, if they're not allowed into this party and it's, it's a tight-knit run or uh, – vibe we're not allowing the wrong guys in here we're creating the right vibe in here if somebody's stealing alcohol or getting drunk too drunk or whatever we're, we're we're kicking them out that creates a better environment everybody else enjoys it a hell of a lot more yeah now from there here's the next thing so people love to talk about boundaries right they love they love it mm -hmm. oh when they get out of pocket dump them you know and that's also good and bad, it's a double-edged sword. Because what I'd also say to you is, if you're gonna talk about boundaries and, and your standards, and you're gonna expect people to meet your fucking standards, and, and, you're, and you're just gonna like, you know, be exclusive. Everyone loves talking about exclusivity because it doesn't require you to actually improve objectively. Everybody wants to talk about boundaries because you just start cutting people off. That's fucking easy. Anybody can be hair trigger with that, okay? So any neurotic dumb fuck that watches a TikTok can cut people off and say that they're a queen or a king and raise themselves a Ted and they're exclusive, okay? So the, the problem with those TikToks is not that they're wrong. They're actually correct. Standards, boundaries, self-love, all that beautiful. But when's it come time to actually care about the other fucking person? So what I'd also say is do an audit for the value that you feel for that other person and why you love them and why you want them in your fucking life. Don't just sit there being like, no, boundary, self-love, I'm, I'm a narcissist, but call other people narcissists. Fuck that shit. Think to yourself, what do you bring to the table? So the first thing you're bringing to the table is the energy that you're anchoring the room to. If I'm running a seminar, and if you've ever been to, let's say, for example, one of the free tour events, and I walk in there, immediately, I'm not looking to the crowd to dictate the energy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna anchor myself in the energy that I want the crowd to experience. And that is a habit that I do when I go out to the club, when I'm doing a party, when I'm running a business, when I'm in a relationship, now that I've learned more as I'm older, and so on and so forth. Don't look to the other person mm -hmm. to ground the fucking mm -hmm. vibe. You have to. Yeah, you, you have to be in your lane. And it, that a, lo a lot of that comes with time. And it, it, it's, it's one of those things in the, in the beginning, it's, 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 it can be hard to do because you don't like you throw your first party. You don't even know what a, a, a boundary is yet, you know. But I, I really like what he's saying here. One, one of the things that I would check in the list. By the way, I'm not looking at my fucking phone. Yeah, <laughs> we have a list for you. We have a, we have a list of things. Um, 
One, one of the other things I'd say is that from a, when it comes to boundaries, yes, it, it, it's one of those things where people definitely overprescribe boundaries, like he's saying here with memes and TikToks. Is it's become so it, it's become a very shallow, you know, kind of just piece of advice. And it's it's I don't want to say I'm trying to think of the right word here. It's 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 a um, it's a platitude, platitude, I guess. Platitude, platitude cliche, cliche, coping. Everybody's doing it. Every Instagram story has it, you know. Um, it has to come from the right place is the, is the thing I want to reiterate. Next thing I want to say is let's move on to vision. You can cool that. When it comes to business in particular and leadership, vision, 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 and having an exciting vision that you're moving people towards will be important as far as getting them to not RES flip. It's so important because I, 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 I touched on this in the last live. If people feel like they, their, their, their vision is muddled or they're not feeling a clear direction or a clear lane forward where they, they can evolve in your business or their DNA feels like there's a lane for growth in the business, if that hasn't been aligned, meaning perhaps maybe they're, they're going to get bonuses or they're going to uh, they're gonna grow within that role, they feel like they're going to get more re- reputation within that role, they're going to get more money in that role, they're going to evolve in their skills and their knowledge in that role. If they're not seeing that lane crystal clear, then you are um, setting things up for an RES flip. And even if another business is doing things in a... Um, in a worse way than you in terms of they, they might have a wor- worse role for that individual, but they set better cl- uh, clarity. A lot of times people can RES flip and go to a company or get poached or whatever to a company, which is not going to even be the best fit for them, but that company provided more clarity. So then they, they, they flip onto uh, the other, the other lane. So that's something else to consider. What I'd say is that People have two different leadership styles. A lot of times you have individuals that are extremely positive, focused on an exciting vision. And the benefit of this is when you get everybody on your team excited is, is you, you keep their winner effect high. You keep them in a positive state. You, and that there's a lot of benefits to that. The other side of it is you have individuals that are more of the, the dark businessmen who are going to really just only focus on the accountability, only cr- focus on creating tension in terms of like having people feel tense or tiptoe around you to not make a mistake or to, all, you know, and, and both come with their set of pros and cons, but you need to find the right cadence of doing both if you want to prevent an RES flip, meaning you need to keep people's winner effect activated. You need to have them set in a clear direction moving forward and have, you know, all the systems and stuff like that, which we're going to touch on uh, for that direction moving forward. But you also need to make sure that they feel a little bit of tension not to make mistakes. And much like boundaries creates a certain tension for people not to cross the boundary and ruin the environment, whatever the environment is. Well, well you're also showing them how to gamify it because gamification like a video game mm-hmm. is such where there's like little goals and then you can win. So you're actually with that tension, mm-hmm. again, it's not meant to scare someone, but it's meant to create little cool wins. Mm-hmm. So there's sort of a criteria there. So imagine where there's this kind of like, you know, people love drama, right? So there's ongoing little cool little wins that's happening. So it kind of feels like you're part of a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a- absolutely. And when it, when it comes to leadership, the first and f- first thing we have to do, no different than what we started this conversation off with, is you have to build up your own value first. You always have to point the finger at yourself before you even think about pointing a finger at other people when it comes to an RES flip. So I always ask myself a few different things when it comes to anybody I'm dealing with. First thing is, if somebody is acting up, let's say I set the boundary, let's say I feel like I'm building up my value, let's say I'm doing X, Y, Z. I'm asking myself a few different questions. First thing is, is there something going on in their personal life which is making them have an RES flip? Is there something going on within the organization, maybe with other staff members, gossip, you know, something that's happening in the organization with other people that is causing this person to act up and have an RES flip? I'm asking myself, are, are they in the... Yeah, same can go to a romantic relationship where they got a friend trying to fuck you up. Absolutely, yeah. All right, and I'm asking myself... Are they operating in, um, do they have that clarity that we talked about before? Are, is this really their passion or do they need to be repositioned? Are, are they evolving as a person and do they need to be financially compensated in a, in a different way? So I, I, I like to ask myself a bunch of questions that force me to kind of put the mirror back on myself before I you know, think about 
some of these other dynamics as well. Yeah, because I think people can can sort of pendulate between you know super nice guy, super nice girl, whatever, and then you go to this like you know super harsh pimp character, or somebody like this taskmaster, and there's there's sort of like a lack of in between. So um, you'll see people that are massive people pleasers. And then you'll see a lot of, you know, TikToks and whatnot that are all focused like, you know, self-love, boundaries, willingness to walk away, um, you know, anything's not good enough for me. I'm, I'm not getting the energy that I want. I'm out of there. And it, all that's going to happen is that you're only going to get losers in your fucking life because anybody who would see that you're just that willing to walk away, they're done with it, right? Like if I'm meeting someone new in a romantic relationship or in a business, you know, maybe they're shit talking the past people in their past relationships. Well, I know they're just going to say that about me when our relationship could potentially end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're willing to walk away that easily because I just like gave them the ick about the slightest thing, it's like, well, sorry kiddo but like clearly no one's good enough for you so i'm i'm chilling right so you know i'm looking for people that also have you know i'm comfortable with people that have gratitude so i actually try to not just focus on like what's wrong in the person i'm trying to focus on what's good about the person and and what i want them to double down on and as a leader you're also trying to put them in lanes where they can fucking win so for example like i'm really really good at free social public speaking and i've had staff come up to me be like we want you to do little short five minute videos. I'm like, yo, I don't like those. I think they fucking suck. Or they're like, oh, and stop doing traveling public speaking and then just sit at home and do little short, punchy YouTube videos for the search engine. I'm like, I hate that. You're putting me in a position where I'm about to RS flip you and I don't want to RS flip you because I fucking hate that. That's not who I am. Mm -hmm. I remember that I'd never known what it was like to truly feel an RS flip in myself until I remember I was in an organiza organization called EO, Entrepreneur Organization, for businesses that do about one to $10 million a year. And I was joining the global board. And, and you'll laugh at this, it's kind of funny. It's probably the opposite of what you think of me. But they said to me, we want you to go recruit people to join EO. And my biggest thing with like, for example, what we do here, take with Blueprint Reloaded as an example. I only want you to be inside blueprintreloaded.com, www.blueprintreloaded.com. I only want you in there if you're genuinely a good fit. I don't want you in there if you're not somebody who's capable or smart enough to get the value. If you're a person of vision, somebody who wants better for yourself, somebody who wants to raise the bar, somebody who sees the value in the kind of topics that we talk about here, somebody who actually genuinely likes money, somebody who actually genuinely likes intimate relationships, somebody who actually genuinely likes being happy and which most people don't. If that's you and you're willing to take it all the way, I want you in here. But if you're not that person, then fuck off, I don't want you in here. And so they told me at the EO Global Board, like just sign up everybody, just get everybody to join. I'm like, I literally don't resonate with that. I don't wanna do this. And I felt myself mm -hmm. RES flipping them because I'm like, I'm not the kind of person to sell someone, mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person to connect someone to something that I think would help them. Mm -hmm. So I felt an RS flip and I wound up quitting. I never knew what it was like, but I realized at that moment that a lot of people that had worked for me, probably I'd put them in the wrong position mm -hmm. and not elicited their strengths. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have a, like for example, a romantic partner, and then you keep trying to get them to be something that they can't be, all that you're likely to do is just trigger an RAS flip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're not having gratitude for things that they're doing well, you're just gonna trigger an RAS flip. Mm -hmm. If you're not considering what it's like to be them and to, and to be them living within your frame and maybe having a little bit of meta level awareness of what your bullshit is like, how annoying you fucking are, mm -hmm. how you might be fucking with yeah. their fucking boundaries, yeah. okay? When I go teach, yes, I'm gonna draw a boundary on the room, but I'm also thinking, is this on fucking track so they get a win? Mm -hmm. And if I'm failing to do that, triggers an RES flip. And nobody's perfect, but that's what the goal is. So win-win means knowing what's a win for you mm -hmm. and what is a win for somebody else. And so, and, and by the way, combine that with the kind of energy, right? You have to be the one dictating the energy. Mm -hmm. In meeting somebody fresh at a bar or club, meeting someone fresh at a party, running a business, having a relationship, stop looking to the other person to control the emotional state at that point. You are at the cause of your state. You view little bullshit chaos or testing as a funny, silly joke. You don't need to be like, oh, I'm gonna pass this test. They're being chaotic. I'm gonna put my foot down. I'm trying to put my foot down. I am angry putting my foot down. That's the key to show my foot, by the way. I'm gonna put my foot down. That's the key to show the foot. <laughs> foot shot. I'm gonna put my foot down. I'm gonna put my foot, okay? If that is you, and that's all you have, it's just you gonna put your foot down because you learned it on TikTok. Wow, that's real leadership. No, real leadership is you dictate the state from within. Yeah, and, and, and real leadership is 
you actually show that you're the leader and that you're willing to do the same things that in, in, in many ways that you're asking that person to do. You know, what are, are you the, when you're especially when you're first having a company, are you usually the one showing up on time? Are you the one, you know, working later hours? Are you leading by example or are you just telling them to do something? And unfortunately, with business and especially in the self help community, we talk, we put a lot of emphasis on be a boss, don't be a worker, you know, separate yourself from the business. It's not a business until you can, you know, be on a beach sipping, you know, drinks while the business just runs and you're completely away from the business. There's definitely something to being, you know, an entrepreneur who's not working in the business and working on the business. That being said, we don't put enough emphasis on being somebody who can work in the business and setting that example that you're also an individual who's willing to get their hands dirty and your staff see that as an example. Because if you're not sh- sh- willing to show that, then what, be- what can begin to happen is that your, your, your staff doesn't buy into you. And if they don't buy into you because you're not willing to get your hands dirty, then they can have an RES flip. Now, on the converse side... Well, Sid, why don't they just complain? They should just complain about hypergamy. <laughs> don't worry about leading yeah. by example. Yeah. Just complain about hypergamy Exactly. But the, I'll make a nuanced point about this. The flip side of this, the paradox, is that familiarity also does breed contempt. So you have to understand, you know... When to hold them and when to fold them. You have to understand, when do I need to be a leader by example and get my hands dirty so that people can relate to me and that people don't get an RES flip and that people and so that people can trust me so that they don't get an RES flip? And then when do I need to show more value by pulling away? And it's this constant dance you're going to be doing between displaying status, value, being the Rolex watch, being scarce, having people invest, having people compete for your time and attention, whatever it is, and showing your leadership in that sense, showing the value side so that people don't RES flip you. And then on the converse side, building trust with people, showing relatability with people, building comfort with people so that people see that you are like them as well. That can also prevent RES flips. And it's a dance and that you're going to do between the two of those. You have to, and it, the cadence between shifting from displaying value and trust to prevent an RES flip depends on your personality, depends on who you're dealing with in business, depends on the specific situation you're dealing with in business, but you have to dictate what that's going to look like for your situation. Yeah, and I would say another big one is always keep your cool. I'm not a big fan of piping off because here's the problem, okay? And, and I've made this mistake. If you pipe off, you believe that maybe you're providing some kind of a surface, a service. Maybe it's kind of like dramatic, it's like performative to try to make them realize the mistake that's being made. But the problem is, Anytime that you pipe off or you make a threat that you're going to cut somebody off or even do like a fake breakup or fake firing or whatever, they will carry a micro trauma permanently. And later when they go to RES flip you, they're going to bring up all these different things that you did. So another way to do it, and you know, my friend Brandon Carter is actually amazing at this, is like big Brandon Carter. Okay, his nickname is BBC. <laughs> I mean, that's the main key to, that's, that's the main key to all not getting yeah. RES <laughs> Be nicknamed BBC yeah. and have the be- Yeah, so it's one of these things where... Um, he always views it as funny. Like, I don't think I've ever seen Brandon like explode on somebody or get mad at somebody. So in other words, like with my kids, right? Like my kids will come up to me and like, you know, maybe throw something or get kind of chaotic. They're testing my boundary to know that they're safe with me so that they're testing me to know that they're safe with me. Okay, so they might start acting chaotic. And I just, you know, kind of pick them up and tickle them in the case of my kids, not maybe an adult, but you know, pick them up and tickle them. And then kind of like, you know, like on their stomach or something like that and go, hey. And then I look at them in the eye and say, hey, is that what we want to do? We don't want to do that, do we? Do we want to do that? I don't think we want to do that, you know? So it's like, yo, yo, hey, I don't think we got to do that, right? Like, so for example, if we're at seminar and you're acting the fool, I don't necessarily, if you're being fucking crazy and disruptive, I don't got to get all angry about it and start exploding to make my point. That's overcorrection. I can view it as hilarious and start clowning with you um, and then by clowning with you and showing you that I'm keeping my cool, but it's funny, it's really doing two things. One is by keeping my cool, I'm not buying into that frame of chaos and negativity. So I'm not feeding it. But the other thing is that I'm also joking, which shows you that I stayed loose enough that none of this is a threat. And if none of this is a threat, what you're doing, now you feel safe to be within my frame and within the containing environment. So again, like these are real skills. It might take a little bit of meditation, it might take a bit of time. And you say to yourself, well, I don't want to learn this. It's all too hard. Like, yo, you don't want to learn real value that you can bring to someone. You don't want to learn real leadership. Like you just want them to 
fuck you and give you money and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so how like, entitled like, are you? like how entitled are you? Like, why not learn basic level leadership skills now? And I don't know if you want to add to that kind of like, you know, way of sort of like in a fun, calm way, kind of being firm, but funny and hilarious. Mm -hmm. I think that's always the best go, except mm -hmm. unless it was real crazy. But that said, the other one is also learning to parse out um, content from testing. So in other words, when someone's being chaotic, knowing if that was a test of the environment of your leadership, in which case they'll feel safe if you pass it, or if it was a real genuine feedback that you were, and God forbid that perfect you could do this, um, being considerate of their, of their position. And just because someone is like under you, remember that they can choose to leave any time. Like I, I certainly always knew that about my ex-girlfriend. Like she was like often very submissive to me, but I understood that like that was a gift that she gave to me, mm -hmm. that she could withdraw like that and that plenty of guys would be happy to have. So like, is that really a weaker position or is that a gift that she was giving to me when she was at, at the periods that she was doing that really beautifully? So it's one of these things where um, recognize that like, you know, an employee that you have, for example, like, yeah, maybe your organization's amazing. Maybe they're going to test to know that if this is like a valuable place for them to put their life force, energy, time, attention, and existence and to live within your frame. So maybe they're gonna test, but maybe God forbid perfect little king or queen you mm -hmm. kind of fucked up and didn't think about them. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to really, really, like that's, I think that's one of the hardest parts of real leadership mm -hmm. is knowing when it's a test of containment mm -hmm. and if it's actually a real critical feedback you have to take on board and maybe something you want to fix. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of that boils down to paying attention to their subcommunications first and foremost to see if it's genuine. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is look at their track record. Do they have a track record of giving critical feedback in a, in a, in a healthy way or do they have a track record of nagging and complaining and being irritated and being angry. And uh, I think that helps you to discern that. But when it comes to passing the quote unquote shit test uh, of a staff member, um, and he's saying, be funny. The key is also, is, yeah, yes, be funny. But the key he said there is be unreactive. As soon as you get reactive, the negativity goes into a downwards. It's, it's a negative feedback loop between you and that other person. And exactly what we wrote here. Yeah. Anchored to HVE and dissolve LV. Such yeah. a big part of leadership, uh -huh. by the way. And as soon as you do that, it's like, it's like as soon as you respond in a positive way and you're bit, you're, you could be funny about it or you're being unreactive about it. They know that they, they know that they are messing up in many ways, unless they're completely oblivious. And a lot of times they'll come back to you later and apologize for their behavior and so on and so forth. But if you get angry when they are being unreasonable because you're reacting to them, then all of a sudden nothing gets done. And at the end of the day, you're trying to find a solution. You're trying to get a result. The, ob the objective is to get a result. The objective is to get things done. So this is just a better way to get things done. Yeah, and by the way, we're gonna keep going, but notice we are coming up on that 60 minutes and we promise you this, are you seeing a better thing to do than watch podcasts and say that Null is a hoe? <laughs> I know, right? It's like, I would love to, I love those podcasts, but let's see that stuff get injected into them. Like, let's find the synthesis and bring up the solution. Yeah. It's very easy to diagnose problems. Well, actually, uh, sorry, that's wiping away too much of the work that's done to do that. It's great that problems are being diagnosed, but we do have to find a solution to come back together, not just blame, 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 yeah, blame, what, blame. What, what they've done is a great first step. They've taken us from A to B to generate awareness of these problems, but B to C is about solutions. We're trying to bring solutions. Not to mention that hypergamy is your friend because what it means that you can optimize it and you could be a two and you become a 10. Be excited about it. That's, that's the funny thing about it. You should be seeing the gap between where you are and the value you could be bringing to the table. Yeah, and, and it's like, Aren't you happy that you could make $100 million because people will pedestalize you? Aren't you happy that you could date someone that would typically be out of your league? Uh, because and, and you could literally have it to where they'd be open to like many different types of even arrangements that would sound off the wall because you can raise your value so high? I, or do you just want it to be easy, like seven with seven, eight with eight, 60K job, white picket fence? Like, what do you want? Yeah, and I, I, I think... A lot of people just aren't excited about it when they hear about hypergamy because they're confused because they just don't know the steps. Okay, build my value, but build my value how? Mm -hmm. So it's about getting clarity on how they're going to actually do that. Yeah, by the way, is there something happening up there? I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Hello? Is that the wind? Is it windy out? Wind? I've never heard that. I was like, do we have to draw a boundary? <laughs> <laughs> I literally was thinking that no, some, no, like, the fucking wind! Yeah. Nature's not taking the boundary. Now, Let's go back to, I just, I've never heard that sound. I was like, are we being like, like anyway, okay. So it's Satan. Now, okay, it's the guys from the podcast. Like, we're getting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it already. Angry 
<laughs> yeah, we, it's we, not about a way. Yeah. It's, not a, it's a generator. Hypergamy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. By the way. <laughs> yeah, by the way, these are our homies. We got love for these guys. We're. It's literally friend to friend, mm -hmm. just saying, "Yo, bring some of this stuff in there." Like more folks on how to meet new people. More folks on vibes, yeah, frame controls, they're, humor. They're not, they're, at the end of the day, look. Yeah, yeah. They brought the awareness to the table, and yes, they're our friends, but you're not going to change DNA. And that they're fighting against DNA. You could, you could talk in a cert, on the round table all day, but you're not going to change the DNA. So you, you have to now evolve the conversation to say, okay, there's millions of years of evolution here. This is where society is currently at. This is how the DNA is interacting with modern society. And now how do we come up with a win-win solution for everybody? Yeah, and what I would say is that um, you're not going to put the new reality back in the box but it's not that hard to learn the skills we're talking about here. Real leadership has its own rewards. And mm -hmm. <sighs> anyway, I could, I could go on and on about this, but here's, let's just go to the next fucking point, okay? I got mad love for every, everybody building awareness. I got mad love for just about everybody, but always aim to be solution oriented. Otherwise, you're basically just like a, one of the disgruntled people that you're dating who's just pissed off and, and doesn't know what the fuck to do, okay? So within the frame that we're talking about here, let's move to the next point. The next point I wanna say is, look, if you're getting paid a couple million bucks a year and you have a team member that's making 80K a year, 120K a year, 30K a year, you know, whatever the case, maybe half a million a year, but you're making a couple million, on some level, you have to be further down the path than they are, okay? It was funny, I, I was mentioning um, you know, a, a celebrity client that I picked up today. And the guy that introduced me to him is a guy that has done, um, th that I've watched mm -hmm. go from being like an old school fan of mine mm -hmm. to building a business that, that has done as high as two million a day in revenue, mm -hmm. okay? So if you were to do that for a whole year, you'd be looking at over $600 million, $700 million a year in uh, total revenue, right? And he built this actually out of an info product. Now, so he's actually the guy that introduced me to the celebrity client. Yeah. And this guy, I have watched him go from just being like a funny dude I'd see out at the club and we're just clowning and stuff to becoming like a consummate major, major, major leader. And you can see how, how much he's had to evolve in his thought process, right? So he's earned that lifestyle that he has. I'm really incredibly proud of him. I'm literally sending him text messages going like, bro, like I know you from the club. Like how did you change so much, you know? But he never heard me talk about business either. And we had like an incredible three hour business conversation and it was really, really a lot of fun, right? Well, if you're advanced, like for example, let's say that he's advanced. And out of that, like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year that he's bringing in, um, he's keeping a big chunk of it, but then his staff might be getting paid 30 grand a year. There's some capacity in which he's more advanced than the person that he's leading. Now, there's many different areas that that could be, but one of them is the ability to transmute negative energy into positive energy. So in other words, you go into an environment where somebody might have a lot of trauma or they could be easily triggered or whatever, right? They've got pain body. Maybe they need to learn to meditate a little bit more, whatever the case. And they're looking to you for leadership because maybe you are more grounded than they are. And they would like to learn that from you via osmosis. So they're willing to make less than you make because you're more grounded than they are. And in the process of them maybe acting out and then you transmuting that into present positive energy and, and you um, even exerting things like, for example, crucial conversations or nonviolent communication, which by the way, crucial conversations, uh, which is run by Vital Smarts, is in all 50 of the Fortune 50 and in about 300 of the Fortune 500. We brought Vital Smarts in our organization. What Vital Smarts and crucial conversations, you could read the book, what it teaches you how to do, is how to remain calm, not feed negativity, and come into a crucial conversation that could actually have a lot of tension and leave that tension actually better off and tighter. Learning crucial conversations is so much more powerful in my view than like kick the hoe out or like some crazy shit like that, that all that's gonna do is, yeah, maybe you get a snap back from that, but all that you wind up getting is them having a memory that you gave them the boot and eventually when they get a DM from someone better than you, they're gonna run off as opposed to you exerting real leadership. So that is a skill set. Like I'm sure that you've seen that in mergers and acquisitions where um, you know, the environment's getting tense, people are getting crazy and mad and you've gotta bring light into that environment. You gotta be a light bringer. Yeah, you, yes, especially when there's a lot of money on the line and people, you know, it's money is tied to your DNA, right? It's tied to your resource. So pe people get tense, people get aggressive, people get selfish, there's greed, there's, um, there's miscommunication that can be happening, and there's a lot of things coming all at once when a deal needs to be closed. So the crucial conversations part of that is so, so, so important. And then it's also looking at things like, and we, we were chatting about this, capturing issues as they come up, having a way to capture issues as they come up. So yes, crucial conversations, but then also like, okay, if, if something's 
if there's an issue happening again and again and again, being quick to identifying those issues, capturing those issues, creating a system around those problems that come up, and then have and then making sure that things like like little issues that are coming up are not lingering in different people's minds, which can then have its own momentum to it, and then create miscommunication and so on and so forth, which ultimately just muddies the water, and that's not what you want to have happen. You want a tremendous amount of clarity. Yeah, now you have people in your organization gossiping, talking shit, making fucking chaos. And by the way, all the money is made when you're in momentum. It's not just time is money. Time, focus, and momentum is money. So if your significant other is raising a bunch of shit and you don't know how to transmute it, you come out of momentum, you start making less money. And by the way, be clear about this. If you're in a business, you're, you could be making five million a year, but your SAS making, you know, uh, 100 grand a year. That 100, year, uh, 100 grand a year SAP member, they start raising shit they'll cook the whole damn thing. They'll get it and because you're the leader. Mm -hmm. So they may create so much, they may act out and create so much chaos that by the end of it, they lose their job because you run out of money, mm -hmm. you go in debt and you lose your fucking job. Mm -hmm. Your goal is not to let that happen. So anytime that you're interacting with people, you can guide them to where they're helping you mm -hmm. or they can pull you down. And it's not just about getting rid of them. It can be in some cases, but it's also about the way in which you're leading. Now, by the way, mm -hmm. something that Sid also mentioned here, there's a couple more points that we had. Um, so we had uh, regular check-ins. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, in those regular check-ins, hearing what they need, mm -hmm. but not in a way where you look needy though, by the way, where you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm like so negotiable because I'm desperate, but, but a healthy type of check-in from authority and leadership. Likewise, um, you got to remind people what they're getting. Cause sometimes they can actually forget. So you say, Hey, you know, what are you getting? And like in the same way that you want to dissolve and transmute negativity, you may want to remind people from time to time, what your background is, what you've been doing and what some of the wins are, um, and the benefits that they're getting. So you wanna have a time to review wins and that could be with your, your romantic partner, that could be in your business. Have a time to go over wins and to celebrate wins that they're doing. Also give them recognition. Again, hypergamy, hypergamy, meh, hypergamy. It's like, but did you even talk about the celebration of wins? Mm -hmm. um, another one is also be system oriented. So for example, like Sid said, have structured times to get issues off the table. So in other words, like, you know, say you have a significant other, maybe every Thursday at noon, you get the issues off the table. So they're not just being brought up all the time in real time and get, taking you out of momentum, not just momentum with work, mm -hmm. but momentum with fun. Yeah. You know, you're killing the fun. And, and, and monopolization of your mental bandwidth. Yes, killing, it's fucking. It's like a parasite on your brain. Fucking killing yeah. you. Um, and then another one is also, um, and, and this is actually kind of like, you know, probably the last one that I would say, um, actually I'm gonna give a couple more, but, but the main one I wanna focus on is, I forgot, one sec. Um, Oh, here it is. Here's the main key of everything. I have team members or relation, people I have had relations with. And they come to me and they say, I'm mad about this episode. I'm mad at this person. I'm mad about that. That is somebody who's not as advanced and as far down the road as you are. So they're getting stuck. They're what's called a prisoner of the moment. That's, by the way, that's what's limiting them from becoming millionaires. That's what's limiting them as far as like being on your level in the relationship romantically, et cetera, et cetera. But they're looking you for leadership always bring it back to the fucking system. As soon as anybody that I work with calls and goes, this happened, I go, wow, that sucks. That sounds really incredibly frustrating. Hey, check it out though. If we implement this new system that we put in place, then things will be good. Now we learn something from it and then we create accountability around those systems. I think frankly, if you do that, it's amazing. And then last couple points that I wanna make, just rehammer, just rehammering this again, I want you to think about it like, demanding loyalty is for losers, relying on connection is for losers, mm -hmm. recognize that most people are automated and unconscious and that they're actually looking for you to lead for that reason. Remember these things and within that, okay, now again, demand absolute loyalty, demand absolute connection, romantic relationships, mm -hmm. but recognize that you're generating that through your behavior too. It's a dance. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's people that are kind of scummy or evil or traumatized or whatever, but it is also a dance and you've got to be doing your part of the dance. If you're truly doing the dance per perfectly and you're not getting anywhere, then yeah, you know, they got to get off the fucking bus. Okay. But other than that, understand it. Also, last point, recognize, um, and this was another powerful thing that I wrote, even though it's kind of, sounds kind of dumb, but recognize it. For example, if you have an employee, keep their compensation structure within consideration when basing whether or not you rate them as an A player, B player, or C player, right? Like if you have somebody making 15 grand a year, but they're doing that role really well, they're an A player. Um, they might not be somebody who's like, you know, getting certain roles that they're not ready for, but they're an A player within that role. 
So if you're with somebody who is, you're romantically involved with and you know they're a bit more emotional, well, you have the leadership position, so you have the benefit of that. They've given you that. They've agreed to kind of co-opt your frame. So within that context, they're allowed to be a little bit more emotional. Maybe they're, I mean, in most cases in relationships I've been in, they're a lot better looking than me. Um, maybe dating people younger than myself. So if that's the case, then recognize that within a larger context, I want to bring some value as well. And that value is not, around, is not about tiptoeing around them. It's about me being on my purpose, creating an environment with, with a vision to it, with a direction forward, with good vibes. I'm anchoring that. And these kind of systems put in place, I'm adding that. And when you have this, honestly, when you have this, you have now become irreplaceable and you will generate loyalty and connection and ride or die beyond your wildest dreams. But sometimes it takes taking that titty out of your mouth going, mommy, 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 I want to poopy. I want to pee. I want to claim, complain about hypergamy. And you go, no, like I'm ready to grow up. I'm ready to live in the real world. I'm not looking for toxic, unhealthy codependence and total acceptance of my bullshit. I want to bring something to the table too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you, it's, it's all about getting into momentum with this. In the beginning, it's clarifying what are the steps to actually get to that point. You get those steps down. You get a mentor who can help you out. You get, to, you get that down, and then life gets easy. Yeah, so you have a choice. You're at a fork in the road. Will you go and complain, or will you join the team of the winners and that people are complaining about? A lot of great information out there. But in other words, um, yeah, I kind of got to pick, right? Um, but there's a lot of great information out there. Take it in, but realize that's often just to build awareness itself. Get the awareness, understand it, but then let's be solution oriented. I believe that this is the way that society will move forward. And I believe this is the way that you'll get it to where every guy can get an incredibly loyal wife or an incredibly loyal girlfriend. They can get a ride or die. And it's not that hard to learn. And I, I promise you in less time that you spent looking at videos on the internet, you could be learning this, getting on board with it. But again, the base level understanding is from our last video. Stop being bitter about how the world works. It's not about enabling people. It's about not having people enable you. You're a fucking person who can lead. You'll get this. It'll be awesome. I've had to learn the hard way. We all have to learn the hard way. And we thank and love those people that allowed us to have that lesson, okay? Get inside www.blueprintreloaded. I promise you the type of leadership and examples of these things in there, the exercises that will show you exactly what to do are contained within here. It is fucking amazing. I promise you nothing but the best. I respect you. And if you come to me and offer to be in my frame for a minute, I promise you, whatever you learned here in a quick little video like this is nothing. It is dog shit compared to the effort of the beautiful experience that we've tried to create in here for you because it's about your results, your money, your time, your energy, your romantic results, friendship results, life results. Get inside of the Blueprint Reloaded. We put so much time and effort in this. I'm so proud to be introducing this to you. I don't want to take you to somewhere truly beyond your wildest dreams. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you inside the Blueprint Reloaded. Be back with more soon. Peace.